Okay, so the, uh, this session is the uh, uh, real practice concern of the complex PCI. So the let us start of the, this session. So we have the available panelists. Uh, and also the I am Byung Kim is the one of the co-moderator. Uh, is the other moderator is Jung Min Han and Ju Young Han. So first and second uh, lecturers that I will introduce. So the first lecturer is uh, Ju Young Han, as uh, his topic is intravascular image guided or angiography guided complex PCI. Professor Han, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ju Young Han from Samsung Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. And these are my disclosures. Previous trials have shown lower rates of major adverse clinical events after IVUS guided PCI than after angiographic guided PCI, but have not been considered definitive owing to limited sample size, short follow-up duration, or the inclusion of highly selected coronary lesion subsets. Our group has already reported uh, the long-term benefit of the use of IVUS in patients undergoing complex PCI in an observational study. However, major guidelines recommend IVUS or OCT in a special lesion subset as class 2A, not class 2, uh, not class 1. Therefore, a randomized trial with adequate sample size is needed to confirm the benefit of intravascular imaging-guided PCI in patients with complex coronary lesions. The study objective of Renovate complex PCI was to investigate whether intravascular imaging-guided PCI using IVUS or OCT would improve clinical outcomes compared with angiography-guided PCI in patients with complex coronary lesions. Our hypothesis was that intravascular imaging-guided PCI would reduce target vessel failure compared with angiography-guided PCI in complex PCI. This trial was an investigator-initiated, prospective, multicenter, randomized, open label that is conducted at 20 sites in Korea. Patients with complex coronary artery lesions were randomly assigned to undergo either imaging-guided PCI or angiography-guided PCI in a two-to-one -one fashion. For patients who had been assigned to the intravascular imaging group, the choice of IVUS or OCT was made at the operator's discretion. Complex coronary, coronary artery lesions included true bifurcation lesions, CTO, unprotected left main, long coronary lesions, etc., based on our institutional registry data. We had minimal exclusion criteria to enroll a broad spectrum of patients with complex coronary artery lesions. We adopted the most contemporary criteria of PCI optimization by intravascular imaging based on expert consensus document of the European Association of PCI. Stent optimization was defined as a sufficient stent expansion without major dissection or major malopposition. MSA was recommended to be greater than 5.5 square millimeter and the four, uh, by IVUS and the greater than 4.5 square millimeter by OCT or the ratio of MSA to the average lepharous lumen would be greater than uh, 80% in non-left main lesions. In left main lesions, uh, seven for distal left main and eight for proximal left main uh, was recommended. We had a standardized protocol for selection of reference size, stance size, and length. Uh, Intervascular imaging could be used at any time during the PCI procedure, but is mandated after stent implantation. If a stent optimization did not occur, additional dilation of the stent or additional stent implantation was recommended, and the repeat evaluation and intervascular imaging was mandated. The primary endpoint of this trial was a target vessel failure, defined as a composite of a cardiac death, target vessel-related MI, or clinically-driven TVR. Secondary endpoints included target vessel failure without procedure-related MI, the individual component of the primary endpoint, uh, 
and it will uh, definitely stand to thrombosis and a safety event associated with the procedure. From May 2018 to May, May 2021, 1,639 patients underwent randomization with 1,092 assigned to the intravascular imaging guided PCI group and 547 assigned to the angiography guided PCI group. Protocol violation or crossover was minimal and the uh, follow-up was excellent. Baseline clinical characteristics were well balanced. Uh, mean age was 65 and the male patients were predominant and about uh, uh, half of the patients presented with ACS. Baseline angiographic and the procedural characteristics were well balanced between the two groups with regard to complex coronal lesions and number of vessels with the disease. In the intravascular imaging group, three quarters of patients underwent IVUS and one quarter of patients underwent OCT. During a uh, median follow-up of 2.1 years, the incidence of uh, TVF was 12.3% in the angiography-guided PCI group and 7.7% in the imaging-guided PCI group. The uh, difference was statistically significant. In secondary endpoint analysis, target vessel failure without procedure-related MI, cardiac death or target vessel-related MI occurred less frequently in the imaging group compared with the, the angiography-guided PCI group. TVR, TLR, and definitely stentous thrombosis uh, the, occurred less frequently in the imaging-guided PCI group than the angiography-guided PCI group, but the statistical significance was not achieved. In conclusion, among patients with complex coronary lesions, intravascular imaging-guided PCI reduced the risk of target vessel failure uh, compared with the angiography-guided PCI. The results of our trial uh, was presented in the ACC this year and it was simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine. One of the important issues is the uh, prognostic impact of operator experience and the IVUS guidance in real world practice. In our institutional uh, database, we selected 605 patients undergoing complex PCI. We chose uh, five years at uh, the cutoff point for the experienced uh, because the, this uh, relationship uh, shows uh, at five years the relative risk of uh, a cardiac death or MI declined to uh, start to decline. Overall, uh, experienced operators uh, did well. Uh, complex PCI uh, better than uh, the less experienced uh, interventional cardiologist. The IVUS guided PCI was significantly associated with a lower risk of a cardiac death or target vessel MI among uh, ex less experienced operators as well as uh, the experienced operators, but the benefit was greater in the ex less experienced operators compared with the ex experienced operators. So in summary, uh, the IVUS was beneficial uh, in less experienced operators as well as experienced operators, the, but the benefit was greater uh, in less experienced operators. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jill. Yes, congratulations again so on the, the publication of the, your uh, great uh, trial. So the uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Do Yung Gang. Is, uh, his title is uh, OCT, or I was guided PCI for complex coronary lesion. Uh, thank you. I'm Dr. Do Yung Gang from Asa Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Han uh, showed a great data that showed that you have to use the imaging guided PCI in the complex uh, the complex uh, PCI. Then I will talk about the, which imaging device would be better for complex coronary region PCI. This is the key analysis of the Octave's trial that compared OCT versus IVUS in uh, the daily practice of PCI and was presented in the TCT as a clinical, uh, feature clinical research uh, one month ago. I have nothing to disclose. 
Uh, intracranial imaging guided PCI for complex coronary lesion showed superior clinical outcomes in renovated complex PCI trial. However, OCT and IVUS have shown comparable outcomes in guiding PCI. However, the comparative effectiveness of two devices for guiding PCI for complex coronary lesion is still unclear. Now, whole two devices is recommended as 2A, and our Octavius trial that was published in a circulation this August that compared OCT versus IVUS guided PCI in 2008 patients showed comparable clinical outcomes between two devices. And this is a key subgroup analysis of the Octavius trial with the complex coronary artery lesions. And inclusion criteria is the complex uh, coronary lesion that pre-specified criteria with the unprotected left main, bifurcation disease, aorto ostial lesion, CTO, severe calcified lesion, ISR, long diffusion lesion with a stent length more than 38 millimeter, or multivessel PCI at index PCI. And imaging guidance was performed using standard techniques with the IVUS or OCT in a boot and IVUS Boston. And stent sizing and optimization was followed by EA PCI expert consensus, and all data were measured by the independent imaging core lab. And study outcome was a target vessel failure, a composite of death from cardiac cause, target vessel MI, or ischemia-driven TVR and maximal follow-up. The main analysis was performed in the age-treated population because this is the post-hoc analysis. And two, among 2,008 patients, 1,475 underwent imaging-guided PCI for complex coronary region, and among uh, 738 randomized patients among between groups, seven, 119 underwent OCT-guided PCI, and 756 patients underwent the IVUS-guided PCI that showed more crossover from OCT to IVUS in complex lesions. And over 99% underwent more than 12 months follow-up. And key baseline characteristics shows that mean age about 65, and the female gender, female sex, about 21%. Uh, and previous PCI history was more common in OCT guided group. And unprotected left main was more uh, prevalent in IVS guided PCI. Otherwise, uh, bifurcation, CTO, uh, other uh, factors were similar between groups. Mean syntax score was higher in IVS guided PCI. And the other procedural characteristics were similar between groups with a mean number of stent 1.8 and mean total stent length per patient about 56. Total amount of the contrast used was higher, about 37 cc in OCT guided PCI. However, the total PCI time was about five minutes shorter in OCT guided PCI group. Procedural outcomes, angio-guided procedure success was similar between groups. However, imaging-based success rate was higher in IVS-guided PCI group because of the lower rate of the major marrow position or major dissection detected. And the procedural complications requiring active intervention is a little bit higher in IVS-guided PCI group. And core at QCA level showed that QCA was not different between groups except for the uh, slightly higher in segment diameter stenosis in IVS group. And core lab imaging analysis by the region level, by OCT itself or IVS itself, showed the, that the bigger minimal stent area and a higher stent expansion rate in IVS guided group with a higher stent optimization criteria met. This is the primary outcome of target vessel failure of the media, median follow-up of two year and the maximum 4.8 year. Hazard ratio of the 0 0.87 that showed comparable clinical outcome uh, the, if, in the OCT and IVS guided PCI. This is a detailed list of the CV outcomes and no difference in death. However, target vessel myocardial infarction was lower in OCT guided group with a periprocedural and spontaneous MI. And contrasting induced nephropathy and other stent thrombosis, TVRTR was similar between groups. We uh, furthermore performed the propensity score adjusted population analysis with the overall weighting or IPW analysis that showed similar clinical result. Sensitivity analysis, uh, the, this is the outcome of the uh, kaplan meier curve, same as result. And suborder analysis by anatomical factors with the unprotected left main, 
any bifurcation, true bifurcation, l to o s t e r region, CTO, severe c a l c i f i e d region did not show any significant difference between groups. However, in ISR region, the OCT group showed a bit better uh, clinical result with the P4 interaction 0.009. There are several limitations because the observed number of primary outcome events was lower than expected in the main trial. So this subgroup analysis also have inherent limitation of statistical underpower. And it was not possible to mask the imaging modalities from the patient and investigators. Therefore, the possibility of ascertainment or selection bias can happen. And there would be the possibility of discrepancy on site and core like measured imaging interpretation and the generalizability and reproducibility of the finding may be potentially limited due to geographic variability in the use of the imaging devices. As you know, that in Korea, this is in Korean trial and the imaging use rate is very high. And we did not perform the cost effectiveness analysis of the two imaging modalities. So this is a summary of the key findings in this s u b r o analysis of the Octave trial. Two imaging devices showed a similar risk of target vessel failure, and incidence of the target vessel MI was, and the procedural complications were lower in OCT guidance. And in anatomical s u b r o analysis, OCT showed better clinical performance for treatment of the ISR. The amount of the contrast I used was higher in OCT group, and, but it was not related to an increase of the contrast induced in the prophecy. So let me conclude my talk. This is the, in this pre-specified analysis of Octavius trial with the complex coronary lesions. OCT and i v o s guided show the similar risk of the composite outcome of target vessel failure during median two year follow-up. Therefore, you can select any imaging device even in complex coronary lesions by your preference. Then I will guarantee the similar clinical outcomes. However, owing to insufficient statistical power and inherent limitations, from several analysis, overall findings should be hypothesis generating and further research is needed. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gang. The uh, third topic is calcium challenges where to shock uh, from left to main to bifurcation. Uh, I, I Patrick uh, Lim. from Singapore, please. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, my name is Patrick, I'm from Singapore. I'm here to talk about um, shock wave, where to shock and from left into bifurcations. I have no disclosure of notes. So from the sky position statement on where the use of shock wave is, it's after lesion preparation standard uh, equipment and you're unable to achieve uh, full dilation of lesion and that's where uh, lithotripsy is recommended. Uh, it's quite a straightforward device, uh, generator, connector, and then balloons, which range from 2.5 to 4 millimeters, 80 pulses in the current system. Uh, personal experience, I think quite limited, 60 cases over the last two years, mainly in the left main LED, and uh, of which 14 require rotational hysterectomy to deliver the shock wave, and then about 15% required guide catheter extensions to deliver. and normally using the much larger ones on the larger side, 3.5 to 4 millimeters balloon. Uh, so I'll show the four different cases uh, where I felt that short wave could be helpful. Uh, so the first case is a de novo disease, uh, rota shock, so 78 female, moderate mitral stenosis, frail, porcelain aorta, chronic kidney disease, BMI 16, known left main disease since 2019, non s t e m i managed medically, chest pain daily, and uh, EF dropped. Uh, core angiography showed a heavy m i c r o a n g u l a r calcification and severe calcification across the left main to the proximal LED. Uh, this is after quite a lot of struggle. To, uh, but this is blue uncrossable, m i c r o c a t h e t e r uncrossable, rotor 1.5 uh, with a uh, balloon pump support in view of the EF. and the osteo left main on the top right, and the proximal LED, concentric calcification, um, and MLA of two, uh, three. Uh, persevere with a non-compliant balloon, 3.5 mm NC, balloon ruptured. 
uh, and show a shock wave from the first uh, first ten pulses on the left, where the lesion has not expanded, and the final ten final ten pulses show that lesion expanded. So it's quite subtle, I think, uh, but it's there actually when you see the balloons up. And then you always confirm it with a non-compliant balloon size one to one. We show full lesion expansion. And then two stents and job done. Uh, second case is a de novo uh, distal left main disease and shock only without rotational atrectomy. So 75 year old female, unstable angina, good LV function. So this to left main calcified disease. Trafication, but osteoramus and osteosuc were both uh, un relatively undiseased, so provisional stent. Uh, I just confirmed what the angiography showed. Uh, standard balloon prep with 3540 NC. Dissection in scene, but just at the IVUS run the top end, the lesion still has not released, despite what the fluoroscopy showed. Uh, so shockwave, full shockwave, stent, post dilate, and uh, reasonable extent expansion, no residual stenosis in, and IVUS confirms the finding. So I think the first two cases uh, demonstrated the use of uh, shockwave in left main, uh, quite safe, quite straightforward. Uh, they allow you to get away where non-compliant balloons might not be. And now to the off-label usage of shockwave. So case three, uh, under the expanded stent. Uh, these are the ones that we see a lot on the pictures. Uh, 74 year old male, right below knee amputation, diabetes mellitus. Previous PCI in 2015, this still left me into proximate LED. That's the only detail we had. Uh, angiogram, uh, suggestion of a distal left main disease, diffuse distal disease, and after three millimeters high pressure NC, showed that the, the left main, the distal left main stem was never fully op opened uh, against a calcified segment. Uh, MOA was 4.5 after high pressure NC. So again, BR option was a short wave. Uh, three finds short wave and that achieve better expansion, though not fully symmetrical. Uh, case four is a stem regret. Uh, so, 84 year old female, hypertension, and stemmy presentation. So, um, Dimitu flow in LED, diffuse calcified disease across proximal mid vessel, wire. Uh, no flow, balloon uncrossable, again, microcatheter uncrossable, so rotor free wire and 1.2 fiber. And then sort of used a 2 to 5 NC score flex, lesion sort of expanded, put in a stent too quickly. And initially, angiographically okay, but then and on further inspection, actually, the whole prox mid and proximal left means the LED stent is not expanded. So in this case, uh, to achieve better results, a three millimeter shock wave was utilized. And after that, that allowed uh, better expansion of the stent and post that of a three ONC. So uh, third and fourth case highlighted the role of probably shock wave in stent under expansion. And um, so uh, there was always some concerns about the effects of shock wave lithotripsy on drug leading stents and what happened to the to the polymer. I think there's quite limited data on what's, been, uh, what's available. So this is in vitro study and suggests that at 80 pulses, there will be some degradation of the stent's polymer uh, across the uh, most commonly used stent platforms. Uh, but also to take into context also, there's also when you look at the effect of IV on polymer versus passing a stent through a calcified lesion, the stent is degraded to a similar extent on both, so I think there's both sides of the coin for this. So tips, uh, tricks, uh, I think this is what I learned from the first lesson was when we first uh, used shockwave, we used dextrose, dextrose and contrast, it didn't work. You need a bit of salt in your solution to conduct electricity. 
uh, don't inflate the balloon until you cross the lesion because the short way is normally a one way street. Until you've really crossed, uh, do not inflate because you will not get it back down again. It works a lot better on de novo disease rather than bailout. And if you worry about ischemic time, split the doses, five, uh, five pounds, five pounds, and stop. Uh, benefits of uh, compared to rotational atherectomy is that you can maintain both wires. So in summary, <laughs> Shockwave offers a unique treatment option, uh, potentially lower risk than other calcium-modifying treatment available today. It does not replace debulking. So debulking first, then Shockwave if you'd like to. Uh, imaging is crucial uh, to evaluate these results, both pre-prep, post-prep, post-end. I think the main thing for Shockwave for everyone is uh, cost effectiveness and therefore case selection. It is a costly equipment, and I think, I think that's where everybody has to be more mindful as to when it's, when it's approved and when it's utilized, which cases you use it for. Uh, it's very well tolerated, even utilized high-risk groups, uh, low EF and uh, left means, and off-label usage in standard expansion in calcified lesions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Lim. The first topic uh, is tips and tricks in performing ultra low contrast PCI by Anthony Ong from Hong Kong, please. Uh, thank you so much, Chairman. So uh, actually, thank you. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Complex PCI, for inviting me to talk about this. Uh, I would like to share with you, uh, you guys, about tips and tricks to save contrast in PCI, which is actually very important, is in especially in complex PCI. Uh, I think the uh, generally <clears throat> accepted definition for ultra-low contrast PCI would be to use a contrast volume less than uh, your, creatine clear your patient's creatine clearance. This is maybe less than, um, uh, in a simpler term, EGFR. Uh, for anything uh, with contrast volume equal or uh, equal to three times of the EGFR is is classified as low contrast. For, anything, for any PCI higher using contrast volume higher than that would be classified as high volume PCI. So why is it important, of course, to reduce contrast nephropathy? And uh, in, page, in, in intervention is doing CTOs, we know that we want to reduce hydraulic dissection of the coronary. Also, we don't want to inject contrast. And in patients who are in hemodynamically unstable, in active heart failure patients, we don't want to uh, put them into an intubate, uh, put them into a ventilator after the PCI. So we want to reduce contrast use. And um, more importantly, nowadays we're doing more and more complex PCIs, which uh, we that involve long duration of procedures and also involve a uh, large volume of contrast. If we we can reduce the volume of contrast using that complex PCI, actually we can achieve a more complete revascularization without doing stage procedure. So I think the step one, which is actually the most important, would be to prepare your mind. Doing an ultra-low contrast uh, volume PCI is slightly different from that um, of your, your routine PCI. You have to actively think how to avoid injecting contrast throughout the whole procedure, even from just putting the patient on table and preparing your manifold. Uh, you should be extra alert if your patient has underlying CKD, underlying uh, heart failure, or blood pressure is low, or low LV injection fraction, old age, uh, lean body mass, fragile, or when you are doing complex PCI. And uh, first of all, to avoid using too much contrast load, always search for any prime coronary angiogram, which could actually save you to doing another few shots of contrast. Uh, when you engage the coronary uh, guiding catheter, actually you don't need contrast. You can use those experience when it jump into the uh, ostium, just like when you do a transeptal puncture, you jump, uh, you, you can notice that kind of jumping of the guiding catheter into a coronary ostium. And uh, if you are quite sure about that, you can use your guide wire gently to probe to see whether the guide wire goes down along a normal coronary anatomy. And, uh, if you really want to inject contrast uh, um, at that time, make sure that you are not using a side hole catheter because side hole catheter actually weighs a lot of contrast. And you can actually test whether your guiding catheter is inside the ostium or not by flushing normal saline and watch for the ECG change. So the 
left side, on the left side, you can see that the calcium of the left main actually dance with the, your guiding catheter. And on the right side, when you use the guide wire, actually it flows down the LAD to, um, anatomy, the course of the artery. And when you infuse normal saline, actually it will induce some ECG change, usually a taller T wave or in the inverted T wave. Uh, and the second most important part would be to get, to get a very good shot of your coronary angiogram, because that should be all that you have throughout the whole procedure. This is your roadmap. So it should be done in biplane without panning the table and in low magnification. And uh, if you have the coronary roadmap function available, you can turn it on, but I personally don't rely very much on that. Uh, you have to create a very good mental picture in your brain after seeing the angiogram, study it uh, in details, try to memorize most important branches and the curvature of your coronary arteries. And um, after each and every uh, contrast injection, you have to withdraw uh, the contrast staying in your guiding catheter out before you administer another drugs or changing the guiding catheter. And you always refill the guiding catheter before you really do the con uh, do angiogram shot. Uh, use of IFAS is mandatory uh, in this co low contrast PCI. And actually you rely on uh, good IFAS imaging to do the whole stenting uh, pre uh, strategy, uh, planning, all kinds of things during your PCI. Uh, because you try to avoid another angiogram shot throughout the whole PCI. And you have to do that kind of angio IFAS co-registration in your mind. So I would only recommend experienced um, imaging operator to try this ultra-low contrast uh, PCI. If you are not very familiar with um, your IFAS, please don't try that because you will end up doing more complication uh, rather than um, maybe you, you should do a, a conventional volume PCI instead. And uh, some operators actually advise the use of pressure wire. Uh, I think it's potentially useful. You can narrow down your target of intervention, but I personally don't rely very much on that when I, I'm doing ultra-low contrast PCI because the pressure wire itself is uh, less easy to be manipulated and uh, it may end up with dissections. So the coronary stenting, as I mentioned before, you, uh, the, the planting strategy, the sizing, the uh, length, all uh, you have to decide is basing on the information you have from your IFAS. And, uh, and how do you land your stand is uh, depending on the mental picture I've just uh, mentioned. And uh, you can also try to use side branch, side branch wires as markers, uh, but uh, uh, be aware that the, when you wire some side branches or you wire some um, tortuous arteries, actually this uh, wire would straighten up the arteries. So that may change a little bit of the anatomy uh, in your head. So um, throughout the whole procedure, you should also monitor for any symptom of chest pain, ECG change that may signify complication. And if complication uh, do occur, uh, please do angiogram. Uh, you shouldn't only focus on minimizing contrast by risking your patient's health. So the final step would be optimization, again, based on your imaging. Uh, imaging only can tell you whether you have any um, uh, edge dissection and then expand the stand. The only drawback would be you don't know why this to wire perth. So uh, final angiogram would be uh, still needed, I think, just for legal reason. You have to do a one good shot, make sure there's no complication like distal wire perf, side branch occlusion, etc. So this is a very uh, short case for illustration. And 60, a 78-year-old man admitted for uh, unstable angina. And the nephrologist actually talked to him about dialysis because his creatinine is more than 500, with EGFR around 10 only but uh, he had um, um, uh, continuous, continuous chest pain, but he's still not keen for dialysis. So uh, I still go for the PCI. I do a very simple angiogram because time is running short, so we can see some hazy lesion at the proximal LAD and one focal lesion down the mid LAD focal lesion. So from IFAS, so I skip the IFAS, I only give you the 
picture. So the IFS show a significant proximal LA deletion and significant, significant mid LA deletion. And I plan my distal landing, proximal landing using IFS. And this is the final angiogram. I think the angiographic result is good. The IFS results are actually also good. Uh, the total contrast volume, uh, including the coronary angiogram and the PCI is 30 mil, is not considered to be ultra low contrast, but th this was the best thing I could do at that time because my lab is not very uh, accustomed to ultra low contrast PCI. But I think the good point is uh, still save his, his kidney, his renal function remains stable, and there's still no need for dialysis um, uh, uh, a few months later. So I think in on conclusion, we have to be very vigilant to save contrast in doing PCI. Image guidance is essential, and uh, we have to practice more, and you need to practice these techniques in patients who are not having renal uh, insufficiency so that you can uh, do this technique efficiently when you uh, come up with such a patient. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> Next speaker is uh, uh, Dogo Bak from Asan Medical Center. His title is Optimizing Follow-up Strategies Post-Complex PCI, Answers from the Post-PCI Trial. Okay, thank you. So uh, my topic is about uh, how can you uh, follow up st uh, strategy well in the post-complex PCI patient. <coughs> this is my disclosure. So uh, the, after the complex PCI, even the less complex PCI in the routine practice, so we we're gonna use the uh, based on clinical symptom and the routine ECG. Uh, some physician is ordered to routine treadmill or nuclear imaging test and stress echocardiography. Uh, overall follow up pattern is uh, quite different according to physician's discretion and the patient preference. So uh, looking at the current available guideline, this is uh, the uh, 2019 the European guideline. Uh, uh, after high-risk uh, complex PCI, surveillance of non-invasive imaging based uh, should, uh, could be considered, but the uh, recommendation is to be uh, level of evidence uh, is uh, no evidence uh, class three, and the routine non-invasive based uh, may be considered one year after PCI is to be. So, and the, uh, what about the uh, overall the pattern in the in the world? And this is a. Uh, uh, soon allowed the Twitter and after publication our uh, article and uh, even in US uh, so many doctors in New York City and the routinely do stress testing annually on patient post PCI this is a US status in the New York status so and uh, to define the, this answer we performed the, uh, the post PCI trial published in New England the Journal of Medicine and the, we randomly uh, 1,750 patients, one arm is uh, uh, at one year, uh, the, we do routine functional testing, treadmill and the nuclear stress uh, testing or stress echo and versus standard care alone, we can do a lot of stress testing only in well, when clinically indicated. And uh, just we included high risk anatomical or clinical characteristic, anatomical include the left main, Application CTO, multivessel, and the diffuse long region, and the clinical characteristics we include the diabetic and the CRF or enzyme positive HCS. So, primary endpoint was uh, MACE defined all cause death semi unstable engine hospitalization at two years. So, and uh, uh, after randomization at one year time point, 93% in the routine functional testing group really did. Uh, uh, routine uh, functional testing, and uh, uh, standard of care group 9% to do uh, the stress testing based on symptom. And uh, this is the baseline characteristic left main included 20%, bifurcation 40%, multivessel is 40%, diffusion long region approximately 70%, diabetic is 40%, that is a real uh, the complex patient subset and primary endpoint at two year time point, standard care routine functional testing and uh, primary endpoint, no difference at all. And uh, uh, interestingly, and if you're gonna do uh, routine stress testing and the uh, uh, cath angio and the repeat revascularization, much higher after checking up the routine stress testing. So our key message, is we do not support active surveillance of routine functional testing for follow-up strategy in high-risk patients is undergoing the PCI. 
and uh, at this time in the uh, New England Journal of Editorial, and uh, is a conclude uh, post PCI is uh, provided compelling new evidence of future class three recommendation in guideline. After one year later, this is directly adapted a new guideline that this year, HCCHI and the guideline for a chronic coronary disease and the looking at the guideline recommendation and the follow up plan and the after PCI inpatient chronic coronary disease routine periodic testing with CT or stress testing is not recommended. Is a no benefit a recommendation CRED three level of evidence is based on randomization study and uh, this is uh, uh, clearly cited our post PCI trial. This is a, a direct application is a new guideline after publication of the post PCI trial. So and uh, we also the uh, the published a very important sub study and this month in November and uh, in diabetic patient in the post PCI trial was uh, stratified pre stratified in diabetic status and the diabetic is uh, everybody know well major determinant of adverse event and we do should do more aggressive follow up approach in diabetic patient. And uh, this trial is a uh, 6,600 diabetics. Uh, remaining part two third is uh, a non-diabetic patient. is a uh, quite well balanced the functional testing or stress test group. And uh, overall, compared to the non-diabetic patient red line, diabetic patient is 1.5 times higher incidence of the primary endpoint. And uh, looking at the key result in diabetic group, non-diabetic group, in the red line is diabetic group, is a dotted line is standard care, non-dotted renal line is a functional testing group, and the in diabetic group no difference at all, in the less complex non-diabetic group no difference standard care versus a functional testing group, and the p-value of interaction was 0 0.91, and the irrespective of diabetic status, and the routine surveillance did not provide the much clinical benefit. Also, the remaining issue is about the multi of the left main disease. This is the status of the JAK uh, revision. And the uh, left main and the multi disease today in complex PCI, we are talking about the, and the such a left main complex disease. How can you do follow-up? Such complex patients, still, we don't have a clear answer. And the overall, and the, among the 1,700 overall post-PCI patients, 1,000 200 patients left main or multi vessel disease, and uh, 589 functional testing, 603 standard of care. And uh, in functional testing group, is 90% is routine functional testing, and the standard of care group, 7%, is uh, optional stress testing depending on patient symptom. And uh, in multi vessel or left main disease, no difference at all functional versus standard care group and the statistical difference. In each code of multi vessel disease, each code of the left main disease, we did not find any difference in outcome between the functional and standard care group. So, and the multi vessel disease, and the, we did not find any uh, the difference in the mace, this finding only increase the frequency of the non-essential invasive procedure without providing any benefit in hard clinical outcome. This is a true key message. My final slide, I'm coincide and strongly support again, regardless of the diabetics and regardless of the multi vessel or left main disease, routine periodic testing with the coronary CT or stress testing with or without imaging is not recommended to guide a long term follow up strategy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bach. The congratulations, very fruitful. Uh, uh, result from the, the post PCI rate uh, study. So it's time for the discussion. So is there any comments from the panels or audience? Uh, I'm uh, Wei Zhong Huang from Taiwan, from Taiwan Gaozhong Regional General Hospital. Uh, I have a question to An Anthony. Uh, I think the contrast is very important uh, in PCI because less contrast will uh, <coughs> induce less complication. In our center, we published a paper in JEC about the 
uh, in the poor renal function patient, we will arrange the post PCI one time hemodialysis will reduce the risk of the further hemodialysis. For as your opinion in Hong Kong, would you arrange the uh, hemodialysis for the poor renal function patient after PCI? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Huang. Uh, actually, I think uh, in some selected cases, actually, yes, we will proceed to a temporary hemodialysis for patients with uh, pre-existing very poor renal function. But uh, I think that would be decided as a team approach. We would discuss with a nephrologist, then nephrologist would assess. Actually, they would also consider social issue uh, for the patients and, uh, uh, and a shared decision making between, I think, the cardiologist, nephrologist, and also the patient. But I think that is uh, really a good point that sometimes we, we will do temporary HD for those kind of patients. But if we can, uh, from a cardiologist's point of view, if we can minimize the use of contrast as low as possible, I think that would help the patient a lot. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask to Dr. Patrick, uh, how do you select uh, IFL uh, size balloon for uh, eccentric calcifications? Yeah. Ext sorry, extensive or eccentric? Eccentric one. Eccentric. So I think eccentric ones, I, I think the, is, the size of the balloon normally is by your EEM by IVUS. So you use the distal vessel EEM and then, to, so then that normally you can oversize a bit for your more proximal lesion. If it's talking about nodules, those are more difficult because the, the balloon membrane is quite prone to rupture. So if you use a IVR as the first balloon, you are going most, you sometimes you might lose your, your, you might waste the balloon. So sometimes preparing first with a, a more stiffer NC balloon might be better. So in terms of if I'm not wrong, so you're talking about eccentric calcium, the sizing will be EM. Okay, uh, because uh, some of the, the, uh, the calcium is very thick, that's why we have to reduce the volume and then crack it. But using the IVL, just a IVL, would, would crack all the, the thickness of the calcification, especially in the eccentric one. Yeah, so, so, those, so if it's very thick and deep calcium, normally the, you, you will need to at least have some degree of debulking first to, to allow you to expand it better, I think. Uh, that's, but, but that's my limited experience. Um, the shockwave is not uh, be all and all. It's, it still has its limitations. Okay, thank you. So I have two questions to Dr. Gang. So. Thank you for your excellent study and recent publication. And, uh, the, the first one is, why did you perform as treated analysis instead of uh, intention to treat analysis? In my memory, in your main paper, you did uh, intention to treat analysis. And the second question is, there was a, a trend to trend for a decreasing incidence of a peripheral MI in the OCT group compared with the IVUS group. Do you have any plausible explanation for those results? Yeah, thank you for that very important question. Uh, because this was the non-precified post hoc analysis of the Octavius trial, we did the edge-treated analysis because the complex PCI trial result was not a pre-specified or the randomized trials not stratified by the, the presence of the complex region. So we did the edge treated analysis uh, because we thought this is a post hoc analysis. So we approached it in the registry based with the maximal far off. And second, uh, there was a trend of the lower procedural MI in the OCT group. And maybe that uh, would be related to a less aggressive treatment in the OCT group because of the lumen based sizing and a little bit smaller sized uh, stent and NC ballooning in the OCT guide group. That could be related to the less proce procedural MI. But yeah, that, that, that's my uh, explanation. Um, may I have a question to Professor Park? Actually, uh, congratulations to your uh, excellent guideline changing post PCI trial. So, we now know that we shouldn't do routine uh, interval uh, uh, non invasive assessment post PCI. But, how about for patients with like 
di on dialysis with calcium, calcified nodules in the very beginning, uh, especially those eruptive calcified nodules that tend to recur uh, only a few months after PCI. So uh, sometimes we encounter such patients, and no matter how you treat, they always come back uh, very quickly. So should we do like rec regular surveillance for this type, particular type of special patient? Yes, uh, I think that is the most typical point, you know, and after publication of the post-PCI trial, we don't do routine the, uh, the stress testing. So, but uh, sometimes a patient symptom is sometimes subjective at the time, uh, depending on the patient symptom and the clinical situation, for ESRD and HD population, we sometimes do uh, the CT scan follow or and the stress testing after on the basis of the finding and we do decide a, a subsequent uh, coronary angiography or repeat revascularization. Nowadays, uh, we just uh, uh, doing the symptom-oriented uh, uh, you know, follow-up strategy uh, uh, the, as shown in the guideline updated. Dr. Park, uh, I have a short question. Post-PCI trial included high-risk PCI patient and your result adapted in recent clinical guidelines is congratulations. But I, my point of question is that, is there any difference in the your result between ACS and the CCS type yeah. of presentation? Yes, uh, that is a very important point, and that was uh, uh, one of our key sub-study, and uh, uh, we was presented in the TCT uh, uh, at the time as uh, the abstract, and we'll be, we will plan to publish. And in the uh, in ACS group, is one third of patient is ACS, and two third is non ACS patient. We didn't find any difference, and even in ACS patients, routine follow. Uh, did not provide the additional benefit. That is the same in the HS and the non HS, and the also will be published in Jack and multivessel and Neptomain disease. And the this month is published in European Heart Journal, diabetic, non diabetic, no difference at all. I would like to ask uh, the same uh, trial. And, and how should we uh, discriminate the uh, listening to patient uh, in the daily practice? So oh, the routine uh, stress test uh, is not effective to find out uh, the, such a kind of patient. Uh, so oh, the, uh, especially in diabetic patient, uh, silent micro ischemia occurs uh, when uh, who has a listening reaction. So what kind of... Uh, um, uh, daily practice uh, you, uh, you recommend? So, and I think the, just the available of the patient symptom and the clinical situation, we don't do, and the, if patient has no symptom, no sign of ischemia, we don't need uh, the further you know, non-invasive or invasive strategy. But then the, we do routinely follow up the patient, we sometimes do and the ECG or blood test and blah, blah, blah. Patient complained uh, some chest pain and the new evidence of ischemia change at the time, we can consider uh, and uh, additional the testing. That is uh, the current uh, routine practice also in the, our practice. Even in the diabetic patient uh, with yeah. the silent yeah, migraine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Han, I'm Dr. Wang. Congratulations for your uh, excellent study for, for, uh, for the IVAS uh, image guide uh, PCI is better than angio guide PCI. Uh, I have a question about the, according to Otibus, uh Dr. Kang study, uh, actually there's no difference in OCT and IVAS. But in your group, about 70% use IVAS and 25% use OCT. So do you think in the future, maybe we don't need the OCT, we just use IVAS, it's better to uh, reduce cancer, so that's the issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very uh, good questions. Uh, in our study, there is no significant difference uh, with regard to, to target vessel failure between IVS and OCT, but it, uh, there was another uh, randomized study. And uh, I think the two modalities are not com uh, competitive, uh, but complementary. So that's why we allow the free use of IVS or OCT according to the physician's discretion in our trial. So uh, probably uh, physician, uh, 
choice uh, of uh, imaging modality maxim may maximize the benefit of intravascular imaging modality. So because of time limitation, we will get the only one last question from audience. Yes, uh, yeah, Professor Park, I have a, a question regarding your uh, post-PCI uh, study. So in case of, uh, of uh, ACS patient and high-risk PCI, but we cannot complete, uh, do a complete revascularization. So uh, do you perform any kind of non-invasive test routinely uh, during your uh, uh, follow-up? Yes, uh, there is a, the, one of a very the, you know important question or very difficult question and the to resolve. And in we our post PCI trial, we perform the subgroup analysis depending on incomplete versus complete revascularization. But its a finding is not the straightforward. There are many many uh, hidden bias. Uh, incomplete revascularization pa patient usually very old age much complex patient and the much, much comorbidity. So, and uh, you know, and the adequate adjustment is not uh, feasible. And uh, so the reason why we didn't provide the, the such that analysis, but I think your question is very important. Uh, the incomplete revascularization, complete revascularization. If you're gonna do incomplete revascularization to the salium scan, there are still residual ischemia. At the time, what can you do the next step? That is the uh, you know, most uh, the difficult the question, but it's at uh, that times so we do the symptom-oriented decision making. Even though I, I also have many questions, but uh, because of time limitation, I'd like to wrap up this session. Thank you very much for speakers and panelists. Thank you.